Hello, everyone. Welcome to my live stream. This is two weeks ago, we had lesson zero of the observational drawing and watercolor portraiture class it was a live stream here for everyone to attend and join along. This is doesn't have a lesson number, but it's like a, a bonus session, which is parallel to Oh, so there's a if you could um, I have some friends in Zoom at the moment. If you're able to mute that, thank you, Barbara. Um, yeah, for those of you who are in the course, if you want to get into my Zoom room, you can join and ask me questions. I'm going to go through my observational drawing technique again, like I did two weeks ago, and then do a full portrait of the wonderful Lena Coy, who is an incredible artist and friend <clears throat> who was also on the Drawn Together show uh, almost a year ago. And I will bring up the, the reference. Um, oh, I still have a, a different background on here, but wait a minute, we'll do it this way. So you can grab a screenshot of this reference there. Um, and I'm going to, I have a black and white reference printed out, which I'm going to bring up to draw along with. Um, so uh, happy wife 111, how do we zoom? If you are in the, um, the course group, then Kara hopefully sent you an email or in the Facebook group, there's also a link, or you can find through my website, there is uh, learn with me section and there is a zoom link in there and that's how you can find it so anyone who's in my course feel free to join in zoom so you can ask any questions that you have and um, let me know where in the world you are if you're working along if you're in the class in, in the zoom chat let me know and yeah any questions you have feel free to to put them in the chat and if you're in zoom feel free to ask um, and let's start drawing I think yeah, you can you can use these uh, hashtag uh, drawing with Dylan tag me um, and tag uh, Lena Coy. I put her um, Instagram in the description of the the YouTube video, so you can follow Lena as well. And I'm going to get straight into this. Um, last live stream was the most successful live stream or video I have ever done on YouTube, and it was um, confusing and wonderful. And someone said, you took 14 minutes before you even started drawing. So let's just get into drawing. <laughs> um, and yeah, at any point, anyone in, in Zoom, feel free to, to ask questions. So I will actually, I'll, um, I'll bring this back up later, but I, I've got my, my black and white version of the reference here. Um, and I'm just going to start with some kind of main shapes to start pretty pretty loosely um, just to start getting some shapes down and for those of you who were in the uh, who, who are in the class I I put up the reference so that um, if you wanted you could get started earlier um, but I'm doing the whole thing here so we'll, we'll go through the whole process and now I just want to just for the sake of having something on the paper I I'm just going to put some some shapes down. Just looking at these big, there are these big angles here, which really are kind of helping to to get an initial form. And something which is really um, very helpful, I think, we we'll just talk about it here. But there's lots of like intersecting angles and lines here, even though it's so far it's just a few lines. Um, and the, getting these kind of angles right, being able to spot uh, an angle. And, and to represent it somewhat accurately is super helpful and uh, something that has been very um, important to learn. And I remember getting like just getting angles way off and not being able to, to see why it doesn't look right. But um, a great thing you can do um, if you've got your reference alongside, it's, it's really easy, but it may be somewhere else, is just once you've kind of got one one angle set you can you can just kind of imagine like from from the edge of the page like what kind of how many degrees is is this other angle that is intersecting at and so if you've if you've got it here and you realize oh this is a bit off you can just kind of keep adjusting and realize 
um, with your straight edge and just comparing these, uh, how, how to place this line. And there's an interesting like dark wedge that we have here. Um, this negative shape is uh, really helpful, like spotting these kind of shapes. Um, oh, the top of the paper is just out of view. OK. <laughs> um, yeah. So how, for those of you who are in the course, um, how are you doing? I know some people have just posted their first drawing today. Some people probably haven't started doing their lessons yet. Um, and anyone who's interested, if you're not in the class and you would like to join, there's a link to, um, for more information and to sign up in the description below. We would love to have you join the fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, how's it going for, for those of you who, who are in the class? I, I love seeing your work on Instagram and in the Facebook group. It's, it's very cool to see how everyone's going with it. Um, so I've, I've scaled up the drawing to the size of uh, the paper that I have, which is a bit bigger than this. This is why I've kind of expanded and gone a bit out of frame for the stream. But um, taking note of the, like the, the angle that we have the, the lines at and the nose and the mouth is, and the eyebrows, it's like a, um, this is really key kind of to, to, to get the, the, the tilt of the face right just um, being aware of the, that angle. Because often we can have like a, um, a tendency to, to level things out when it's slanted, particularly if you've learned a lot doing like the frontal kind of uh, Loomis head kind of method. Um, at least I found that was my experience that, and still often is that I will like autocorrect and try and balance things out. But just to, just to kind of um, try and see what, what angle we actually have where the nose is in relationship to how the shoulders coming down here. It's a little bit higher. And so this is still really minimal. There is a hand, um, which you may have noticed which is a, a nice extra complex challenge. But we'll just start simplifying the hand by, by just doing some like external shapes. And looking at negative shapes can also be really helpful with that. Um, and depending on how you're feeling, how much time you want to spend on this, uh, how comfortable you are with drawing hands, you may want to just draw along, or you may want to um, focus on the portrait. But, Sam's babe is really enjoying the class. So much fun and learning so much. OK, cool. That's a, a nice username. Um, hi, Veronica. Uh, hello, Louisa. Happy wife. And Sheila. Oh, Sheila, I, I just saw your, your portrait of me from 30 Faces, 30 Days. Uh, it's super cool. It's been fun seeing, seeing many renditions of myself. <laughs> So I'm, I'm not sure. All right, everyone in Zoom is muted. So if you would like to, or almost everyone, if you would like to say something, feel free to unmute and speak. Um, in case you have said something and I didn't respond, it's because you're muted. <laughs> I have spent the entire day um, painting kind of um, oil onto some wooden garden furniture uh, with a big brush outside. It's like been the, the warmest day of the year so far and just spent the day painting oil onto furniture. So it'll be, it's very, um, it's a nice task just going along, making sure the entire surface is covered, not, not having to consider 
any kind of proportions and colors and values, just, just brushing and brushing and brushing and brushing. <laughs> you painted your garden shed and you left earlobe. That's great. And yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's really cool. I just um, I had Arvid with me. And he he spent hours just just pretty much just hanging out and watching me <laughs> painting the furniture. He's almost eight, and for a surprisingly long time was just content to watch me. Um. I will periodically check out the comments just to see what people are uh, saying. Ah, Sam's babe. Ah, is Nidia. Yeah, cool, cool. Um, Nidima Art. If you want to put your Instagram account names in the chat so you can follow each other and find each other, um, I think that is probably a pretty cool idea uh, because I I know a lot of people from Instagram and when they pop up on on YouTube, sometimes they have an entirely different persona. <laughs> <laughs> or I just don't know who it is. Um, but yeah, it, it could be fun, especially if you're you're in the class, uh, in the course, to to follow each other and follow along with each other's work. And I've I've really I've loved that it's been it's been a week and a half now that the the lessons have been available, and it's so cool that like every day there's there's still someone doing the first lesson, and I know some people were concerned about the. Uh, the speed at which everyone would be working on and, and completing the lessons. Um, but I, I feel like it's nice. Some people are, are charging on and some people haven't started yet and it's it's all good. You can all just do it in your time. Um, yeah, and I mentioned I've, I've just got to... I put Lena's... And I put it in the YouTube description, but I'll, I'll put it in the chat because Lena said that she's uh, really looking forward to to seeing people's work. So make sure you also tag Lena. Oh yeah, it's just Lena dot So I'll um, put that in here. At Lena dot on on Instagram. Lena is. Um, currently in Colombia and is in the process of moving to Ohio. So we spoke like Shannon and I, and Shannon is here. Hi, hi, Shannon. My wonderful friend and co-host of the Drawn Together show. Uh, Shannon and I had Lena as our guest. It must be like almost a year ago. Like it's ep episode 20, I saw. Um, if you check out on my channel, I will, I'll make a point of of adding the link to the episode to the description, but it's not in there yet. But if you have a look at my channel um, and look for Lena Coy, episode 20 of Drawn Together, you'll find our, our chat with Lena. Oh, she is so lovely. I I, I loved how you, you called her Lena Joy. <laughs> She's just so, so joyful and... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she's she's great. If you're watching this, Lena, you're great. <laughs> we love you. And Lena's work is just so so cool. So I'm always excited to see what what Lena's doing. Um when I'm looking for where the, the placement, like I started by, by putting these parallel marks to be like, okay, eyebrows, eyes, nose, mouth. Um, and things are, are maybe a bit, I, I haven't been checking in too much to see if I put things in the right place, but um, just kind of loosely, it, it, it's okay. Um, I, I was 
feeling like it would just be cool to do a, a, a loose piece, particularly the drawing, because I would like to focus on on painting today. Um, but just like once those marks were in place and just from the big shapes I got in the beginning, that provided a lot of information for where I want to, um, like how to situate each of the facial, facial features. Barbara, you see how the microphones activate when when there's something in the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. That's that's um. That's what I do too. <laughs> um. Yeah, I noticed that a couple of people in the course decided to go through doing the drawings. Of, of each of the lessons first, which is a super interesting idea to, um, I guess on the one hand, to focus on the, the observational drawing practice. And I know some people also been waiting for their paints to arrive. <laughs> so that's also a cool way to go about that, waiting for the paints to, um, to focus on drawing first. But yeah, how, um, how has, how's the, How's the drawing been for for people so far, or the painting even? Like I'd be really, um, I know a lot of you've been sharing your work, but it'd be really great to hear from you what um, what has been helpful or what's been challenging. Uh, if you've had um, a favorite, something that you felt maybe favorite because it was really easy, <laughs> or a favorite because it was challenging and you learned a lot. Um, it'd be it'd be super interesting to to hear back from you on that. The first. Oh, great! That's cool. Nice. Yeah, yeah. That's. Slow and steady wins the race. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, I think that's it's that process is so helpful for getting confident with mark making and the um working with ink. It's just a reference in Zoom to the calligraphy pen class that I taught. Um yeah, I think that really helps a lot with being decisive with the drawing practice. So I, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's also really interesting because I've seen uh, it's parallel to my course being released or just after it coming out, the 30 faces, 30, face, uh, 30, faces, 30 days watercolor uh, edition, which I have in the past taught in, um, but that also came out. And a couple of days ago, I was one of the the muses for it. Um, but it's it's always so interesting to see that, like, everyone's approach to using watercolor um, can be so different. Like, there's there's so many possibilities, and yeah. And so if if it's been a long time since you used watercolor, uh, yeah, I guess there's. It must be really interesting to return to it, and um, yeah, there are so many different kind of approaches and, and ways to go about working with it. So, and that's really interesting in the class, seeing seeing how people are adapting the methods that I'm sharing. And Ah, cool. Um, Elizabeth, that you're you're really getting a bit looser. Ignis is still your fave, but you've only finished number three, and it's incredibly helpful. Uh, I'm I'm really glad to hear it. Um, and Felice sketchbook, 
for me, it was helpful to, to put the paper on an easel and not flat on the table. Yeah, interesting. I work much more loose this way. Yeah, it's it's so interesting just what the what the physical, um, like what a difference it makes to be working upright um, or to be standing or to be sitting. It, it can really make a difference. Um, T. Cortazariana. This is a um, Faber-Castell polychromos magenta pencil. Uh, the number is 133. Um, I really like these pencils because they, they have a really nice pigment and you can paint over them and the, the drawing um, remains visible, which is really cool. Um, Uh, Sherry. So how many people here were in the Lesson Zero live stream or saw the replay from two weeks ago? Feel free. I just, I like to not feel alone. <laughs> Cool. Just absorb. Emma, I, I really liked how you shared the the drawing that you started on your own and then you like were drawing along with what I was saying. It was really interesting to see. Um, the the two versions. So cool that you shared that. Um, yeah, and that that live stream two weeks ago, for some reason, so many people saw it, which was really cool. And there were a lot of really interesting um, comments um, and people really giving thought and responding to things that were said. And there was one that was really interesting because, was, Emma, was it you that asked if it's easier to draw big or small? Um, because someone replied and said that they they think it's easier working big because when you when you scale down and one millimeter one millimeter can make such a big difference but if it's a, a bigger surface you're working on that that millimeters difference um, is not as big <laughs> um, like it, it doesn't make such such a, a big impact and I thought that was an, an interesting uh, perspective. Like you've still, you've still got to find your way and put things in the right place. But if you if it's if the your surface that you're working on is bigger, then you have uh, have more room to play. But I just thought it was great. So many people um, weighed in and and said things. <laughs> Someone told me I talked too much, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was it was just uh, fun to hear people's uh, thoughts. So feel free to to leave comments. <laughs> Oh yeah, and someone said it would be really great um, to draw someone who doesn't have glasses. <laughs> and because the last one it was me and I wear glasses. But because <clears throat> I talked about how helpful it is to have the, the frame of the glasses to find the location of the eye. And here, um, oh, I'm just noticing the corner of this eye. <laughs> now that I'm talking about the eyes, it could be shifted back a little bit. Um, yeah, how the using the the frame of the glasses is such an easy way, a helpful way to um, I find to inform me of where to put things, and it's good that it just started, we that I just started talking about it because I just noticed I'm able to use the the nose edge of the nose to realize oh whoops the the corner of the eye is a bit far in, so as as things are being put in their place and getting established, you can reach a, a stage where you start to look around and see, um, to, to check in on things to make sure that you've you've put them in a place where you're going to be happy with them once you start painting. Because at this, at the drawing stage, we can still make adjustments and... 
yeah, so if you if you don't have glasses to help you find where to put the eyes, using the nose, uh, the corner of the mouth, um, and you can like just if you, you have a reference, it's off to the side, so it's kind of it's, I've got my easel is slanted and angled, and I'm standing over here, so it's all a bit tricky. But um, if I look at the screen, maybe I can see it better. Like here, for example, you can take these uh, landmarks to to help um, help you see whereabouts things should be. So, like the corner of the mouth coming up to perhaps about where the pupil would be. Like each each piece you put in place just helps you find where everything else should be. And there's you can start really loosely and you can do like a six minute drawing and then just start painting. Um, but you you can you can like keep adjusting and keep checking in on things until you've got a a really finely tuned drawing. And I won't do that too much with everything, but having the eye, I'm glad that I caught that, that the eye is, was too far over. Eyes uh, play a fairly significant role in, uh, like it, it's it's immediately glaringly obvious when, when the eyes are not in the right place. If anyone is watching this now who didn't watch the, the last live stream, which was Lesson Zero, um, the idea of that was that it was like extra reinforcement for the ideas of the observational drawing practice. Because as things progress in the lessons, um, I, I speak less and less to the particular uh, ideas of like using things to find landmarks, to find your way around and just kind of get more into the flow of drawing and and i felt that 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 live stream as a lesson zero helpful addition to really reinforce some of those ideas about how we we do our initial drawing <clears throat> because the practice that i'm sharing um relies pretty heavily on on the drawing as a, a an integral part of the the portrait painting painting slash drawing. <clears throat> and how are people going with the, the drawing practice? Um, Like something that I often found as I was learning um, when I would watch tutorials and, and follow videos that often the the actual the drawing stage of things I watched some lessons where the drawing was already done and was like, oh how do I how do I do the drawing before I start painting? Um, and yeah, I know. I know from experience that you can spend so long on a drawing. And, and I, I hope that in the classes, like everyone's going to want to be kind of content to some degree with, with the drawing that they're doing. Um, but my, my idea is like, I kind of imagine, or some people have even like had, had a couple goes at some of the portraits um, that you, if you kind of follow along somewhat, uh, with, with with the way I'm drawing, um, like I I've had a, a lot of practice and feel fairly confident in the way I'm doing it, and everyone's welcome to slow down and take their time. Um, but yeah, I'm I just kind of wondering. Uh, I would love f as much feedback as anyone wants to give me on, on the lessons, um, just like the rhythm of uh, the mix of drawing and painting and and how you're finding that.
I've got a lot of these shapes I'm putting in here, which uh, are not as distinct as um, like the eyes and the nostrils. I'm, I want to establish this uh, definition and the, the idea of the hierarchy of line that where it's going to be really dark and bold, then I'm, I'm also intensifying the pencil marks. Uh, so that there's also a variation in the line quality as well, which just makes it kind of is visually interesting. And it's also helping me understand like the the value, the value structure. So I've got these shapes where I'm going to, I know I'm going to have these midtones and shadows, which are not super dark and they have really soft transitions like between the cheek here and then up to the nose. It's really soft. Or well, here, interestingly, there's this long vertical highlight. And so a lot of these like extra shapes in here are just going to help me um, this shadow or light mapping, which is going to help me understand where to, to put in my, my midtones and different value shifts. So there are certain, there, there are kind of like different uh, different elements to the drawing, like some of it's really establishing definition and um, contrast. And some of it is more of an indication of how I'm going to come in and handle the, the paint once, once I start painting. And you can, you can always kind of play around with uh, how much effort and detail you're putting into the, the drawing. Like if you stay fairly loose and free with the drawing, it, it may also encourage you to be loose with the painting process, which is uh, in, in lesson six <laughs> uh, with Mitre is um, something which I really felt like, oh, I just need to loosen up. And I, I did quite a brief drawing and then felt really um, like it was a wonderful exploration in the painting process as well. And that's something that, that can be really helpful. Uh, like if you if you get really deep into the drawing, then it may, you may have the courage to just be totally loose with your painting. But if you've already kind of invested a lot into the drawing, it can be, um, it may, there may be more in, inhibition in the painting process. So it's um, th throughout the different uh, pieces that you work on and do, I think it's it's good to have like a, a mix and try around with different uh, levels of finish in, in the drawing because you may find that you're really um, free and explorative in your painting if, if the drawing is looser. I'm super curious who's uh, who's going to make a zine when once all the the lessons are finished. So part of the class, uh, a bonus, or maybe it's part of the reason why some people want to do it is um, making a zine at the end and putting all the portraits together in a a little booklet, um, making a PDF. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. This is different compared to the last class where all of the drawings were done on the same sheet of paper. Because of um, watercolor, um, the paper warps, uh, it doesn't really lend itself to doing everything on, on the same one. So the tutorial shows you how to use uh, Canva, which you can use for free to make a PDF, which you can then send to get printed. Yeah. Which is... Yeah, good luck. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, and going to do it all on one page. That would be amazing. Every every portrait. Oh, that, that, that would be so cool to have all of the portraits done on, on one, one big piece of paper. 
yeah, and the idea of with the zine as well. I I have made zines where I have like um, a, a series of of portraits or sketches and have uh, printed them and collected them together in a zine. So from the class, it will be all of the the portraits that we do during the class. But then in future, you could um, you, you could theoretically make a zine of any of your work. Um, or you could do totally different things with zines. People make poetry zines and uh, travel photography zines and all sorts of things. Yeah, make a zine. That'd be so cool. Because I, I, yeah, that's something I'd be extra curious to see how people go with that. It's a, it's pretty fun. All right, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good with this drawing. Are there any before I move on? Are there any um, particular questions about about the drawing stage of things? Very light on screen here. Um, Veronica, yeah, drawing with colored pencils instead of graphite is a game changer. Super cool with color these colored pencils that they're not smudgy, um, and that they have the vibrant color. And graphite is still wonderful. And I've just done a really big uh, graphite drawing this week. But um, the colored pencils are so cool that they, they they have their own color. Like there's a, yeah, there's a kind of vibrancy to it. And they don't smudge um, as much as, as graphite does, which I think is also really nice. And also, like they're they're harder to erase. You kind of bit like I did with the corner of the eye. I was able to to erase a bit. It actually worked pretty well. Um, but I feel like with the colored pencil, depending on the ones you use, like sometimes you you just can't totally get rid of them. So it all there's this kind of illusion of security with graphite. They're like I can always erase it, and and I used to erase a lot. <laughs> um, and with the colored pencil, it's kind of it's more you can get rid of it a bit, but I, it feels more, um, kind of definite and permanent as opposed to the uh, ever, ever changeable nature of, of graphite. It's been uh, it's been really cool seeing the work that people are sharing where you take photos of the drawing as well. And I know a lot of people are like, oh, I forgot to take a photo of the drawing. Um, I'll just take a photo of the drawing <laughs> before I start painting. Because it, yeah, it's really it's nice seeing the different stages that people are going through and how it looks. Um, yeah, it's interesting to keep a record just to see like at the different stages like. The decisions that are made just to also for um it's nice to be able to share uh like if you're sharing it on social media to just like share the steps uh, but it can also be interesting just to take a moment to stop and like if you take a photo sometimes you'll notice something like oh that's oh maybe I, i'll keep working on it i i had some pieces in the um yeah, some watercolor portraits where I, I felt like I was done and took a photo or sometimes I'm, I'm about to think, oh, this is good. I, I'm finished. I'm going to put it on an Instagram and then I take a photo. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I need to do this. And then sometimes there'll be some, some final uh, amendments made um, just because I like take a photo and then something like really jumps out at me that I noticed that the contrast could be a, a bit stronger or that there may be one particular thing which I just totally missed and forgot. And just the process of taking a photo and seeing it in a different uh, size um, or just a, a different different approach to looking at it, like stepping back, um, that then you may, may see something which escaped your notice before. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you like my drawing, T. Um, yeah, does anyone have questions about the drawing stage or questions before we get into the watercolor? Because I'm ready to start painting. And I would love to hear from you, especially if you're in Zoom. Um, 
because I thought if if there are any anything you would like uh, me to give special attention to or um, any particular challenges that you're having that um, now is the opportunity for me to address them specifically. So feel free to unmute and speak up um, if there is something you would like to say or ask. Yeah, ask. <laughs> <laughs> all the all the parts of the face. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, there are no ears here, but um, so something in in the approach. So, so the, the it was a pretty broad reaching um, question. That if if you're having trouble with particular facial features, whether it's the ears, the nose, the eyes, the mouth, anything, um, if you are watching on Zoom and on YouTube, you could mute your YouTube, and um, that would be great. Um, so so one thing you can do if you if you're feeling a bit insecure, so it's good before you jump into painting to feel to just take a moment and look at the drawing and and just. Um, decide whether you're really happy to move into the painting phase because if you just take a moment to look at it, you may notice like, oh, there's something there's something missing. I've I, I forgot some part of the drawing. Just to keep keep looking back because having a lot of attention on the reference, if we really take the time to look at the reference a lot, we will notice a lot, and there may be things that stand out. Um, it's very different to uh, Maria Luisa. I know you do a lot of the um, 30 second to six minute portraits with me. Um, it's a very different process when you have like an hour to work on it. Um, and But there may still be things that, that we don't notice and that we leave out. So um, before moving into painting, just to take the time to, to look and kind of um, move around or the these important features, particularly if there's something that you really have a challenge with, and just see how it lines up. Like with this eye, for example, I can maybe check in just the, the angle of the eye. Does it feel right? Um, how it's in alignment? I feel like this is a bit tight. Maybe it would be a bit broader, but just checking in with different things to see how they... Uh, just noting, noticing this dark shape under the eye. To, to maybe that could be a bit more emphasized. Whatever it is, taking that time to look. But then I, I think your question was like, you start painting and then you realize, oh, this ear doesn't look right, <laughs> but you've already started the painting. Um, and then, so starting starting with lighter layers uh, rather than going to full intensity of, of your pigment can be helpful because then there are still things that can be adjusted along the way. Um, and it, to some extent, depending on the paper you're working on, it's also possible to like use a wet brush just to lift some pigment out. But then you need to let it dry before you keep painting um, or to draw on, on it again, it needs to be really dry. So what I enjoy about this process is you can, if you do want to change something or you realize, oh, this is, um, I need to lift some paint here, you, you can kind of re-wet it and, and take some of the, the pigment off. But if you want to draw on top of it again, it needs to be really, really dry before you draw, because otherwise you, you won't really get the intensity of the pencil mark. Um, so yeah, you can lift things if you feel like, if you realize, oh, this is, the ear is in the wrong place or, um, or the shadows within the ear perhaps um, could be different. There's no ear here to um, demonstrate on, but um, Another thing to do is to, to start lightly. Yeah, so maybe I will just start painting now and start with some lighter kind of tones. And I will, for those who are watching on YouTube, I'll bring up the color uh, reference. And for those of you who are in Zoom, I hope that, that you have the reference already. So you'll have the color version. It's, yeah, it's in the,
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, if you um taking a break, it doesn't even need to be a day, but if you go into a different room or you do something different and then you return, then you may, then something may really be obvious that you didn't notice before. Um yeah, and often we will we'll notice different things uh if we if we take some time away because you 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 get so focused on it that if you, it's you come back after just moving um or going to get a drink or whatever, then you may see something different. But yeah, le letting it digest a bit and then looking at it with fresh eyes, that's a good idea. Yeah, you're welcome. And also what I said about... Oh, yeah. That's an interesting idea. Um, turning the drawing and the reference upside down uh, to see... If, if anything looks different then. And that's similar, um, yeah, just like a kind of like a perspective shift. Um, there's this awesome book called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain, which I learned a lot from and has some really great exercises in it. And drawing upside down from upside down reference is one of the things in there, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's interesting. So I'll just, um, so we're talking about this eye? Both eyes, any, any eye. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the the issue that was just raised was the tendency to want to outline everything, um, which when you we can see here that the the light is coming from from above, and because of the so, so the issue was like I, I guess if if we were drawing the eye that we would like. If you're outlining everything, you would have your eye drawn like this. And what you're saying is it doesn't really need that line underneath. And like here, I've I haven't haven't really connected the line, left it kind of open. And when you have the light shining from above, because of the thickness of the eyelid and the eyelashes, and we can I will I'll bring the the reference down again. But um at the top. The top eyelid, uh, because of the thickness of the eyelid, it, it'll often be darker. And so with eyelashes and also when makeup is accentuating the <clears throat> these uh, lines, uh, some people will have it even more intense. Maybe they have thicker eyelashes or they're wearing makeup. And often it is, it's to do with the, the thickness of the eyelid because it's not just like a piece of paper that's covering the eyeball, it has a thickness to it. And so this, this edge here is in shadow, just like because the light is coming from above, like this is in shadow, and then there's this really, uh, this crease here is quite dark because of the, the fold and the shadow, this top edge is in shadow, and then the bottom, so there's this really nice highlight at the bottom of the, this bottom eyelid, so that's kind of the thing, like rather than having um, this line here going all the way around, there's actually a highlight below uh, the eye. And, and so with a, a much softer line, you can kind of imply that form w without having to really um, go hard with your outline all the way around. And, and that will convey the that kind of uh, realistic sense of, of form and, and shadow. And it won't, if, if it's lit from below, it may, may not be the case. So it's not, it's not always gonna be like this, but often you'll notice that the top eyelashes, the top eyelid um, really has a, a much bolder uh, line or shadow than, than on the bottom. And like here, it's going to be 
there's like a mid-tone here, shadow here. And and I, th I think it's a super common thing to like um, to outline every shape. And there are some things, um, and you, you mentioned the nose, Maria Luisa, like, whoops. Um, another, another common thing would perhaps be with the nose um, to be like, okay, so the nose is like this shape, so I'm going to draw it like this. And it could be, um, it has a, a fun style to it. But um, this was talking about the line hierarchy. These lines, like we know that the nose has the shape, but it's so, like the transition between light and shadow here is so gentle that it doesn't really need, like, if you do everything with the same line intensity, it's going to, it'll look like an interesting kind of style, but it will, um, it won't look like it looks in the reference. Like if you go like that all the way around and here, noses are interesting because like it's the, the edge of the nose has a really distinct line here. And then the, the bottom side is like, uh, I should draw it over here. So it's, you can see in relationship to this eye, it's um, so come around here, there's almost like no line. And then there's this here. And the same way this is in shadow because the light is coming from above. The bottom side of the nose is in shadow. But the only things that are really distinct and like where I would put a, a darker line, like I, I did here, is like these, these areas. And otherwise, all of this that we, we know is there is not really very visible. So that's interesting with noses that you know the form and you know it's very prominent, but actually um, the amount that needs to be drawn and communicated is often quite minimal. And yeah, you have like this shadow edge down here, the shadow side. Um, and apart from that, like there's some, some subtle shadow here, but you don't need an outline all the way around there. So what you were saying about doing outlining everything and then feeling like um, it's not quite right. Uh, then you can come back to this idea of line hierarchy that where you notice, okay, this is really, like these are really bold, dark lines. This is really dark. So you may have lines all over the place in your drawing, but just to help with um, recognizing uh, what, what is really dark, like what really is gonna warrant having that intense kind of line even here, like the top edge, that's a, it's really distinct, but it's quite a soft transition between the shadow edge here and the light on this side. So I'm like hesitant to put a really strong outline there. Um, so I still have lines there and there's a distinct shape, but because of that soft uh, transition between light and shadow, I'm just leaving it much softer. So it's very, like in the way I'm drawing here, it's it's rarely the case that something really needs an outline. Uh, so over here, like we have a really intense shadow between the finger and the hand. So there are some shapes where there is a really strong transition, like it's really clear between light and shadow, and then you can have a really strong line. But otherwise, you can just have these soft lines that are kind of implying that you know you know there's an edge there, you know that something is happening, um, but you're leaving it with a softer touch so that you can communicate it in the watercolor, perhaps, or the way you render it, if you're just gonna be leaving it as a drawing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's um. So the that feeling of wanting to hatch everything in, and and you could, <clears throat> like, it. Like if if you, if you feel good about like hatching in the shadows, just because it helps you see and understand what you're drawing, you can put it in and still paint over it. Um, like I in the in the course and the way I'm doing it now, I'm I know that I'm going to like communicate the shadow with the paint. So I, I'm not really getting into it. I'm just setting up the shape that I know I'm going to paint into this. Um, 
but if you if it feels good, if it feels right, it, it could also be an interesting textual layer to the final piece as well, because then you have like some hatching underneath. So if you feel like it, um, you can go for it. But I, it could also be um, if you feel like you're relying on it and you have to do it, then it might be interesting just to experiment with not doing it. Um, but yeah, I, I understand that urge to feel like, oh, this would this be really cool to like hatch this out. So it's a question of the balance between how much of the drawing um, you want to be like carrying the piece or how much you want to get into the, the watercolor. And maybe afterwards, once you put the watercolor down, you still feel like you want to hatch onto it and then you could, you could do it. You could do whatever you want. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, if if the line's super dark and you're not able to lift it to um, to a state where you're content with, what what color are you you're drawing with? So the question was if if the line is too bold, should I start again before I start painting? Like if if these outlines are too strong, because we were just addressing this. Um, the idea of everything's outlined and just kind of realizing, oh, maybe it doesn't need to all be like that. So if everything was drawn with heavy outlines. Um, so this, for example, uh, this is a, a needed eraser. Um, and I can kind of lift a bit. And then because I'm working with magenta, the pencil, I also know I have like an indigo pencil or so, some darker colors. And then I could there are a couple of things you can do. You can either try and lift a bit. I can see here that I can't really get rid of it, but it's softening that line. And then where it's darker, I can I can really go harder with it so that it changes the uh, the kind of, rather than everything looking like it's the same weight, I really go harder on the ones where I, I know it's darker. And and this line still exists, but is is going to become less and less prominent. So that's like, it may not be necessary to start again unless you feel like you can't can't move it, you can't change it, and you feel like starting again, you could. But um, there may also be a way to, and this kind of, this ties into what Maria Luisa was saying, like you realize something is not how you want it, <laughs> that there are, there are ways you can still kind of adapt and change once once you realize. <laughs> Um, and yeah, this, that, yeah, yeah. So, um, so here, like with this example, I've been able to take that where I realized, okay, maybe the, this outline was a bit too much and I'm able to adjust the surrounding line work, uh, making it darker. And, and now it's kind of, it's not as obvious anymore. So that's a possibility. But if you feel like you can't get rid of it, you can't change it, um, and you want to start again, go for it. But um, for the case of this, maybe you just want to keep painting along and, and see what you can do with it. <laughs> or, or, or do it again another time. Um, it's, it's up to you. <laughs> you can draw. Yeah, cool. You can, you can draw Lena as many times as you like. All right. So now I'll move into the painting side of things. Um, so I do have, so this is something I also address in the, the course that the a black and white photo can be really liberating to, to work from because you don't have color information and you're just working on values, uh, which in the first couple of lessons with Ignas and Shannon, it was very much, um, like Shannon was a colored reference photo, but it was monochromatic. So we're really able to focus on the, the value structure. Um, so you may want to just keep looking at the black and white version and choose any color you want to. <laughs> um, but I, I'm going to bring up the color version and let that inform some of my decisions. Um, and I, I have the painting here. So it was, it was really interesting, Barbara, to see that you just uh, did these two, uh, Gloria and Mitre. Um, yeah, so this one was 
at some point I felt like this this uh, the piece of Gloria was quite challenging because I it was getting it didn't feel as loose as I wanted it to be, and so it's, um, but I kept going until I got it to a place where I I felt happy with it. But then I, in response to that, I wanted to do something really loose, which is what I was mentioning earlier, which I then did a, a really loose drawing. I didn't spend so much time working on the drawing so I could feel really free with the painting. And then it was just like from a black and white photo. So I could use any colors I wanted so long as the values were right. And this was just like a super fun exploration and like shaking out the, the tightness of, um, of the piece I had done beforehand. Uh, so yeah, working from a black and white image can be really liberating in the way that you then just kind of can use whatever color you like. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, it was a really interesting moment for me in the, in the process of making the course to like to do those two, um, and have that. Yeah, yeah, that's this one is lesson six. Yeah, oh, cool. Lesson five and lesson six. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Barbara just did those two, so that was really cool to see because I. It was wild. <laughs> ah, okay. So you finished before I was. <laughs> yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I was very much uh, I was learning things and going going through it, and I I felt like that would be interesting to share. So I'm glad to hear that from you. That um that that was uh, entertaining, <laughs> to say the least. To 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 witness my struggle. Um. All right. So keeping. Maria Luisa's comment in mind. I will start with a pretty light, I go pretty light with the color into, into the skin tone. And I'm just squinting at the image and realizing this highlight on the nose and this fingernail are the brightest, brightest, brightest parts of the whole composition. Um, so I, I'll, I'll get the whole skin area wet, uh, apart from the, the highlight on the nose. I'll just lift the ca camera a bit so you can see everything. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you like it. Yeah. Yeah, and it's um, it's interesting to have. Thank you very much, Shannon. Shannon was just uh, praising my drawing, um, and it's interesting to have a drawing that you feel really like, oh, this is like a good drawing, <laughs> and then you're about to paint on it, and sometimes that can be a bit like, what am I going to do with this? <laughs> um, a painting to sit on. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yes, good point. So if you have put a lot of effort into your drawing and you've got it to a place where you're like, wow, I, I really like the drawing. I would like to preserve. I want the drawing to be like a strong part of this because I'm really happy with the drawing. Um, there are some inspiring, wild people who I watch do amazing drawings and just paint all over it and the drawing is just gone. Um, but if you feel like there's strength in the drawing and you want that to come through, um, then it's nice working with watercolor because it's a, this transparent medium that we can, um, like the drawing will stay alive as part of the, 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 the portrait. Get rid of that drawing. <laughs> yeah. I remember Kira, when I did oil painting, she was like, why do you spend so much time drawing it when you're just going to paint over it? <laughs> <laughs> because, <laughs> um, all right, just just because 
it's water watercolor it's wet and watery oh look this is a bit blue um <laughs> i'm just going to put water everywhere <laughs> so i'm yeah even the like the highlights and the eyes are also quite quite dark so that's something which I often think is interesting. You you look at different parts of the the portrait or whatever it is you're working on, and like just within the lips, you see, oh, this is like this highlight. It's really great. We see within the eyes, this highlight here. There's the white of the eyes, but it's actually all um, it all has color to it. Like there's there's not really anything white. And for if you're working on white paper. You can use the white of the paper for your highlights and then just darken everything else. Oh, even if it's going to be bright, just adding adding paint and pigment to everything. And this will be interesting because I am working on an upright surface. Uh, if it stays wet <laughs> um, and I start uh, painting into it, it will... Um, like gravity will, will let the paint kind of flow down. But yeah, thinking about what you're saying, Marie Luisa, also ties in with the idea if you, like what I just said about going in light to keep the drawing, preserve the drawing, if you're unsure about the shape of things, such as an ear, for example, that if, if you're going in lightly, there'll, there'll really be the opportunity to adjust and um, kind of change things as you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. That's right. It's. Yeah, that, that is a great thing to remember. So that the, the hand does look intimidating and it's such a wonderful pose and gesture and it, it does look very intimidating, but it is it's just a shape. And everything, it's, it's all a series of abstract shapes that we're working on. <laughs> it's a tree shape. Um, ah, what are these ones called? What is this red? Is this quinacridone? Red. Yeah, quinacridone. <laughs> um, and this, oh, I've, I had everything memorized. This is, is this raw umber? I think this is uh, quinacridone red light i think and this is raw umber and i've mixed those together to to get this that's what's happening at the moment yeah you're welcome <laughs> there was still blue on the brush <laughs> so uh, it was it was just supposed to be water but it's a super light kind of lavender color that's in there now um but that's just because i didn't clean my brush <laughs> It was a, a bonus blue. No, no, the idea of it is to um, to start brushing into the wetness, uh, wetting the paper and then and brushing into that so the, the paper is not totally dry. And at the moment I'm just using, we, we can, Keep in mind that there are all these different like color temperature zones in the face and stuff. But at the moment, I just want to get the uh, like the midtones and the shadows established without worrying too much about the different colors. So I'm still very much looking at it just in terms of um, value, which like filling in the shapes. And we can keep adding, adding and layering up into this, um, and yeah adding more variety and complexity to the colors, but 
at the moment, I just feel like I want to um, get clear with the, the different kind of shadow shapes and So here, having the paper wet, like there's this really soft edge up here, but this has already dried so much that I'm not really having that blurry, wet, wet, uh, watery shape. But I also love layering up uh, transparent shapes on top of each other, so that's okay. And it's nice having a, a mix of different, different uh, effects as we go. How's everyone on YouTube? Is are, are people working on the portrait in a different medium other than watercolor? And if you have any questions on YouTube, also feel free to ask. This is Hannah Müller um, Burgund Burgund paper, which is a it's structured. Um, it's the same paper that I use in the the class. Um, like it has an almost canvassy look to it. Like there's a, a weave to the paper, so it's not a hot press. It, it has really nice structure to the paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I also look. Yeah, um, it'd be interesting, particularly, so everyone who's who's drawing, painting along with us, it'd be interesting to know um, what you're working with, but particularly from the class, and if you're not in Germany uh, or Europe, <laughs> where I know that you can get the same paper as me, um, it'd be interesting to to hear what paper you're working with and how you're finding it, because that's that's often a challenge, like if, especially if you're unfamiliar with different paper types, to know like what's what's the best kind of paper to work with and so yeah let's let's have a look uh, it is 120 pound yeah so this is what it looks like on the front um 120 pound 250 gram paper oh yeah 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 cool yeah, Archer's paper's um, nice. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the um, Archer's paper is also quite expensive. Um, I the first watercolor paper I ever bought because I went to a, a workshop where it was recommended. I got this Archer's paper, and then I was just afraid to paint on it. Because like I spent so much money on this paper and I can't paint, so um, I'm afraid of using it. <laughs> and and I like about maybe also my the, my perspective has changed a bit, but um, I feel like uh, Hannah Müller paper is uh, not it's not as expensive as Archer's paper, <laughs> um, so I feel more kind of free to use it. Because having having nice material should not be uh, a block um, or a limiting factor if you're then actually afraid to to work with it, which I certainly was. Yeah, Canson's a yeah, cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's like yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's 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 funny right like you get some really nice paper and then it's like well it's um yeah i i found it to be quite uh have quite an impact on kind of my state of mind of um yeah how good i feel about using it <laughs> Thank you. 
Oh, cool. Zan is here working with gouache on a blue envelope. Cool, cool. I can't, I can't wait to see it. Um, you've rotated the image to the left. Oh, yeah. So it's like lying down. Awesome. And everyone who is uh, drawing along, painting along, if you are on Instagram, I'd love you to tag me. And um, if you share to your stories, then I can really easily share it to mine as well which is always nice to do. Mm. Yeah, that, what is the ratio? Uh, the water that you put on the paper or the water on your brush? Yeah, are you also, are you working on a, f a flat surface? Yeah, if you're working flat, like here, my water kind of ran down the page. Um, if I had put, when I got it wet in the beginning, if I had it flat, it probably would have just like sat, um, on there. So yeah, that's knowing how much water to use is also definitely like, um, you just got to try it out and have some experience, but going with, you'll notice like how quickly it dries. If you, if you use too little and you're like, oh, I can't work with it anymore, then you can add water. But, um, if it's really, really wet, you could get some paper towel and soak some up. Um, yeah, but there's, I don't know if there's, there's not really a, a concise measurement to say. Uh, um, but often I would say, like starting with less, <laughs> less intensity or less water, you can, you can always add more to it. And if you go in like full intensity and you get everything really wet, then um, then you may need to go for a walk and let it dry <laughs> or use a, use a hair dryer to, to dry your paper, which can also be a super helpful thing to do. Um, Ed has a paper suggestion. Um, Bao Hong paper is less expensive and it's 100% cotton, cool. So I feel like th these shadows that I've got here <laughs> are kind of the, the kind of level of brightness, which I think the actual midtones would be. So I want to kind of start layering on to, to push things more in that direction. Um, and I can, I wonder this, there's this brilliant opera rose, uh, which is a really like, unbelievable pink color and the first few times I used it and saw it I was just like well this is way too pink but um by adding other colors to it it can be an interesting you can like soften the intensity of it and um it can be fun just to add some really like <laughs> uh high saturation colors in there uh, interesting addition to the mix of things and some of the the pieces in the course where I really experimented a bit more with it and was a bit loose. Um, I could just use colors that in the past I would have been really scared to use. <laughs> oh, cool. Here's another um, recommendation. Hanamula Cezanne for longer work. Um, and you're using a Chinese 100% cotton now. Cool. Um, yes, this is being recorded. So um, you'll be able to come back and watch the replay, which will be instantly available as soon as it's finished. This this will live on for, for people to, to watch and work from. And if you're not signed up to my class and you're interested in doing a series of portraits, <clears throat> we do 15 pre-recorded lessons where I'm super focused and talking about everything I'm doing, um, then you can put the link in the description because um, that is happening right now. And there are many <laughs> wonderful people who are painting along and I'm loving seeing what everyone's doing. Um, <clears throat> Sherry ran across a lot of different papers from many years ago as you're cleaning, cool. Um, trying them in this class instead of using your archer's paper. Yeah, it's been interesting to see what the challenges are. Yeah, so paper quality can make such a difference. Um, 
and the way it's able to carry the the watercolor. Um, you don't want if if it gets so wet that <clears throat> the the paper starts to disintegrate. Um, then it may not be the best paper for for watercolor. <clears throat> um, Veronica, that is also a really good idea, like to start on a the Canson multimedia paper, which like using uh, a cheaper paper. Um, and it, even like I, some of my first watercolor experiments I did were not on watercolor paper at all, um, just to start to get a feel for the color. And um, like you can use anything really, just like if you use printed paper, it's probably not going to work out so well. But um, it could be worth trying out. <laughs> Cardstock, yeah. Like any any paper that has a kind of uh, a weight to it that it's going to be able to handle some some moisture will be beneficial. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, nice. <clears throat> yeah, I thought this this would be a nice kind of addition to the the class. I, I really enjoy the doing things live. And it's it's great doing the pre-recorded videos because I'm I'm very, very focused on kind of my process and explaining everything I'm doing. But it's also, it's nice to um, do something live and have a conversation, be able to address questions. And um, so I, I really enjoy having having the mix here of um, having you here as, as we're painting together. Yeah, I'm glad you're enjoying it. So now I'm just kind of like layering into things, building up the the shadow a bit more. I don't I don't think in this piece I'm going to make the shadows like as dark as they are in the reference photo. I, I am often like staying light with the 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 layering and the shadows that there'll be interesting shapes that um, which are nice to preserve and they they can have the relationship of the different layered shapes uh, can be really interesting. And then I feel like even staying quite light in the value range, and maybe there'll just be a couple of areas where you get really dark, um, but keeping a lot of it pretty light can, like you don't have to feel locked in to doing it exactly as a reference picture is. You know, just like taking a cue from it and and building up until it's like at a stage where you feel like it's interesting and. And now, like I'm using these, I really like these uh, broad, flat brushes, and and just layering brush strokes on. Uh, I feel like the the way these shapes lay, layer up is a a fun way to to work and kind of piece it together, and and just the the quality of those brush strokes and that shape is going to have a, an interesting. Um, like character in in the the finished piece, like just the the way that those layered brush strokes. Um, bit build up the the shadow areas and stuff. Uh, Shannon is <clears throat> saying, hey, Sherry, my Indiana bird friend. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. 
that was that was nice to see that this so so you, do you know each other in in the real world from yeah cool but about on facebook that's cool ah mary jones is shannon um sherry in in case you didn't know Yeah, cool. <laughs> That's nice. I I enjoy the world being smaller, being able to draw together from various places around the world. Who's uh, who is moving next to the state? Oh, cool. Yeah, I don't I don't know where Ohio is. Oh, yeah, I I, I know you've talked about Ohio. I'm just like di didn't realize it was um next to Indiana. That's cool. Yeah, so she's back in Colombia now and um is moving to Ohio. Oh, cool. Sherry said that um, Facebook sharing bird pics started it out and that, that Shannon got you onto following me. That's nice. The so far, everything's pretty warm in here the the white of the eyes especially here on this side it's it's like bouncing this amazing blue color off of off of the cushion and it's interesting that there's this blueness surrounded by like so much warmth um so that will be interesting to kind of take note of um i wonder if it'd be maybe i would just put put some blue in now um just to mix it up a bit and just to have like a different once all this white is filled in it's going to uh gonna look different <laughs> and then be able to kind of um better gauge so i'm just painting water onto here right now <laughs> um better gauge the, the kind of the value structure The oiliest fingers, yeah. <laughs> um, sometimes, if I'm going to do things, <laughs> uh, so I guess this is in reference to like leaning on the paper, and then when you paint watercolor onto it, it's like, oh, look, my fingerprints can't be painted onto because my hands are so oily. <laughs> um, but if, yeah, sometimes if there's something I know I'm going to do where I'm going to be like touching something and I don't want to be super obvious. I'm going to just like wash my hands <laughs> before I do it or put paper on it so I can lean on the paper and then you can get really right on it. But then you, you're you not really leaning on the paper. Um, uh, is this a, a using, I know it happens a lot on nostalgia paper, but on the, the Burgund paper, it's happening. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's interesting. I'm working on a, this is also Burgund, and I think it's the same paper, but it's a different block than the ones I did uh, in the course. And it's, um, it doesn't have such a strong canvas feel to it.
the like the paper behaves differently. Ah, okay. Yeah, I, it was interesting um, seeing your work where with your finger smudges in it. And I, I wouldn't have known if you didn't say that that's what that texture came from. <laughs> this uh, Haut eigene Öl. <laughs> yeah, it's it's cool to have some some texture in there. All right, I'm gonna just take some of this. I think this is like, it's a bit of a mix of blues because I've just got some stuff which is up here on my palette, but it's a bit of uh, cerulean blue and I think a tiny bit of indigo mixed in with it. Just kind of mixing things together, even like mixed in a little bit of turquoise in the beginning. So the, um, the white of this eye is much bluer than the one over here, but I might just, just dilute it with a bit of water and So the white of the eyes are like usually never white. And you can see here, they're actually quite dark if you like squint and look at the reference, that they're more in the like shadow shape than they are in the highlight shape. got this, I haven't used this color a lot, but this it's just called neutral, yeah, neutral tint, <laughs> which I think is a, I, I was kind of like perplexed. So this, this awesome set of paints is from our dear friend Gris. And these are like his hand selected favorite colors. It's, it's pretty cool palette from Schmincke. And I know that Terry got this set of paint. Is there anyone else who who got these paints just for the class? I'd be interested to know. Yeah. I think it's it's like I said in the, the materials list, like don't you don't have to go out and get all the colors I have, but these are the colors I'm using. But yeah, it's great if you've already got the colors or you um, have similar things. Like it's it's really interesting getting to know different colors. Like I have a watercolor palette that I've been using for, for years and getting these colors because in the palette I had, I didn't even know what the paints were. <laughs> it's just like the paints I had and I wasn't really sure what the colors were. So it'd be difficult to tell you what I'm using. <laughs> um, so I thought, because because Gris has such a nice set of paints, it's like oh this would be a cool opportunity to know what the paints I'm using are, and um, and to get Gris's paint set. Oh yeah, nice nice. And who's that? Oh yeah, cool cool yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I um, I did the life book. Uh, wait a minute. Yeah. Oh, cool, cool. Perpetual student is a is a great thing to be, <laughs> always learning. And Ronnie loves neutral tint. That's great. I I, I was not familiar with neutral tint until um, I started making the videos for this class, and uh, it's really it's cool. It's a nice. Neutral tint. <laughs> what are you about to say? What's annoying? Ah. Yeah, yeah, that's this. It's really interesting with watercolors. Like sometimes like the vibrancy when they're wet compared to how they look when they're dry is um, there's something elusive and magical about it. Like there are some colors you put them on and you're just like, wow. Um, and then as they dry, they become muted and matte and they're so vibrant when they're wet. Um, uh. 
That, yeah, that's what, yeah, Barbara was just saying that neutral tint, when it is, when you put it on the paper, it's really dark and as it dries, it's, it's lighter. And it's interesting, like, I feel like compared to, uh, compared to this piece, for example, <laughs> this is a, a much more subdued uh, color palette. <clears throat> and sometimes like in the, the hair that I would have a mix of um, alizarin crimson and ultramarine, and there's like these super vibrant colors within the shadows. And it's interesting to do something which is just kind of a bit more subdued. And I feel like it's really, uh, it feels fitting to the reference as well. It's a very subdued kind of image. And yeah, if we're focusing on on value, then um, then we can really communicate a lot within a, a very limited kind of color range. And within the the lessons in the class, like a lot of them are really vibrant, and I had so much fun playing with the intensity of the colors and but I know I also really, I, I guess <clears throat> part of my background is working with uh, natural inks, which are very earthy, subdued uh, colors in com comparison to the colors I have in the palette here. And, and there's something really nice about having a very kind of muted palette with just a little bit of a highlight, like something which is a bit more intense and vibrant, but, um, kind of resting on a, a more more subdued uh, field of, of color. Like, I think that can be really nice as well. Yeah, yeah, oh, that the neutral tint is an alternate to Payne's gray or indigo. Totally, like there was a moment as I was about to paint the hair and I was like, indigo, neutral tint. <laughs> so um, indigo is a really a great like go-to dark color, like a really dark blue, um, such a, a wonderful pigment. How's everyone doing? We've uh, we've been at it for a while. You don't know how you're doing. <laughs> okay, you can uh, you can just sit back. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, cool, 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 Sherry, that's awesome that you you had your high school students make their own natural inks due to seeing class of mine years ago. It's so much fun. Making your own pigments is, is a very cool thing to do. Add some more blue, just so that there's a bit, a bit of variation, and in this field of blue.
There's um I think Ronnie, you have paints from Beam Paints, right? I think I recall you saying. Because I've just been thinking, I, I just I think that the natural pigments is such a wonderful like I I haven't focused on it so much the last couple of years, but I it's I still think it's so um important and delightful. And there is a a wonderful paint maker, Beam Paints. On, on Instagram, who makes watercolor sets, which are all natural uh, pigments, which I think is very, very cool. And I've wondered, like I, I haven't, these were the first paints I bought in years, like after all of my own uh, pigment making. But um, when Chris bought out his own paint set, I was like, oh, I get closer paints. Exciting, um, and it's also been really cool to see because, uh, in addition to the people who are um, painting along in my class, there are a lot of a lot of people I know on Instagram who have Gleese's paints, and it's really interesting to see and understand that the colors that they're using like to to be familiar with that um, kind of realm of colors. It's really cool. Have some of the greens and blues. They yeah, are nice. I would be very, very curious to use some beam paints someday, someday. I, ha I also have the, um, the supplies to make my own uh, lake pigments, which is basically like you make ink, but then you do the, uh, the, the lake pigment process where you separate the pigment from the liquid, binding it to a... Is it a salt or is it that a metal? <laughs> I have the stuff, but I, I just haven't tried it out. But I um, kind of have the vague idea that maybe someday I'll make some watercolor paints of my own. So I'm just kind of like moving into the, the white of the paper to, to try and get away from that whiteness and just keep brushing in, layering in these new shapes, which uh, as, as each layer dries, there are new kind of shapes and, and borders and shapes on shapes. And I really like that kind of layering effect. Has anyone who's doing the the class had uh, a lesson yet, um, which has been um, which you found particularly challenging, or something which has been uh, hard, like 
like how I uh, there are a couple of them. If if you haven't got there yet, you'll you'll get there in, in the lessons, um, and you realize that I'm struggling. <laughs> um, there there are a couple of those for me, um, which was really interesting to go through and push through, where I considered re like starting again and refilming it, but it's like if I manage to get this to a state where I'm happy with it, I think it will be a, a valuable experience to share. This is um, a flat synthetic watercolor brush. Oh, what number? Um, this, they, these are like almost the same, and this is three quarters of an inch. This one, the size has come off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's been held a lot. These are like I bought this set of I think it was four brushes. Um, when when I went to the illustration masterclass, which I think was in two thousand eleven, and these these were like the from that set, and I'm they're just great. Mm. Yeah, so how do you find using a flat brush compared to using a round? <laughs> yeah. Yeah? Cool. Yeah, and um, the flat is like in the, the calligraphy pen class, uh, there, there's, there's just a wonderful quality and the the variation that you can get with the the mark making with a flat drawing or painting tool, which I have um, really come to enjoy the way of of working with it. Yeah. So now i'm I'm adding a bit more purple into the shadows. Which is a mix of the uh, that I mentioned earlier of um, ultramarine and the lizard and crimson, um, deepening the shadows a bit and um, making making it a little bit like cooler and darker at the same time. There's I still, I still haven't really figured this out with my camera. There, there's a there's a range of color that I can see, which somehow I have trouble communicating on screen. Because like here, this you can see this white is like really white, but I've got to make it really dark to be able to see on screen the the kind of subtlety of what's going on in the color. But yeah, I will be sharing the result uh, on Facebook and Instagram. Um, so be able to see uh, a better resolution version of it to see how it, how it actually looks. I didn't use much of what's this one called? There's like this transparent. Um, oh, what's it called? Potter, Potter's pink. Potter's pink. I think I didn't use much. Um, yeah, and there's there's this grainy ultramarine. So there are two ultramarines, which I um, Chris explained one Tuesday. And the so the one I use most is the ultramarine finest, and the other ultramarine and um, I, I didn't use so much the Potter's pink and that second ultramarine. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, Chris explained that Potter's Pink 
and that um, that ultramarine, that the combination of those is really good for um, sh shadowy walls in urban sketching. So yeah, that, uh, interesting that Potter's Pink is like a nice brick color. Yeah, yeah, that granulating uh, quality of the paint is, is pretty cool. I'm not going to get into painting the hand too much today. Like I'm happy with the, the drawing of it, um, but this could turn into a pretty long uh, painting session if I focus on the hand as well. Because having a hand is like almost like having a second portrait in a painting. It's something I'd be happy to focus on someday. Um, It was interesting. I noticed uh, in the last live stream as well in the <clears throat> in the pre-recorded video context. I, I feel like I'm pretty good at being quite concise, and I, I try to keep the the painting sessions within a certain time frame so that it's um, so that's the feasible thing to follow along with. Like if it takes way too long. If the videos are, are really long, then it's um, like a challenge for anyone to keep up with that kind of time commitment, I guess. So try to keep them relatively brief. Saying under two hours is relatively brief. <laughs> and they vary, I think, between um, 40 minutes and and like almost two hours, the, the lessons in the course. And then it's interesting in the like in the live stream context, the last live stream or in uh, drawn together shows that sometimes it's it's like really um, feels very expansive compared to that kind of concise tutorial filming mode. It's a bit different. <laughs> um, Elizabeth is totally in love with them. The, the mouse nose area, the mouth nose area. Of course, the whole face is stunning. It's nice. Glad you like it. Hey, Lewis is here. Um, Lewis is late, but wanted to spend a little time to see. This is how my watercolor is going. Um, Lewis is busy working on a piece which is going to be in an exhibition in Gran Canaria or in Tenerife. You told me a couple of hours ago that you could tell us now in the chat what, what it is that you're working on. Oh, yes, the, the mouth nose area. But I also like mouse nose. That's that's nice. So, what is the uh, the exhibition that you're going? Is it is it just your exhibition, or are you going to be part of a group show? You can tell us all about it, Lewis. Can't wait to see your your painting. And it's nice that um, Lewis has been sharing like monthly um, a monthly record of the the work that he's been doing in in reels, and that's been really cool to see the the collection most recently of March. And all the stuff that you're you're working on. So in um Often in the course, uh, I get to a point where I, will come back to working with pencils and like drawing on top of the, the painting. And I'm just thinking about almost doing that now and heading towards uh, wrapping up the live stream. We still have some time, but um, 
I really enjoy about this process of being able to then um, draw into the painting. D drawing into the painting, yeah? Yeah, cool. I'm glad you like it. Now, if you're insecure about drawing into the painting after being so painterly, um, yeah, well, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll address that a bit as I work into this in a moment. But um, also, as I mentioned, like starting light and going into it lightly uh, is, is a way to do it. Uh, that, that would be like the safe way. There's a lot to be said for just like going in bold and making a mess of things, <laughs> although it's um you may never want to look at the the painting again, but um it's very educational. But I think that's what ink is such a good uh, medium for, like just churning out a lot of ink pieces to um to really make a lot of bold decisions. But it's if you if you want to go in carefully and go lightly and build things up, um, the I feel like the the collection of like subtle decisions building on top of each other can also create like a, a really uh, beautiful um, qu quality to to the the mark making in a piece, which is very different to the bold directness of like doing something in ink, but also really an enjoyable process. Are there any other questions like at this stage? So Lewis is part of an artist group for a sol solidarity exhibition. What's solidarity or so a solidarity exhibition? What is it that you're painting? Are you allowed to tell us? I'm very curious, Lewis, about what you're working on. All right, I'm going to draw back into this now and maybe I'll I'll just get I'll get in a bit closer with the camera and focus on the portrait a bit. <laughs> uh -huh. So I have the, the magenta pencil I was working with earlier, and I also have an indigo pencil for where I want more contrast and definition. Um, and I'll, I'll go straight to that with the eyes and yeah, this this stage of just like drawing back into the painting is um, something that I like. <laughs> I feel like yeah, there's, there's somehow there's this um, it's just such a a different quality of of mark making, and I I like the way that they combine. It's for a long time, uh, I felt like drawing and painting were two very separate things and um, bringing them together and having like a conversation kind of between the, the, the painting aspect of it and the, the drawing is uh, really cool.
Yeah. Yeah, it's um there's there's something about like the the definition and the crispness of the drawing uh, on top and not everything needs to be redrawn re redrawn uh, like not everything that we drew in the beginning but particularly like with this indigo pencil areas where I'm like oh, I want it to be really dark um, uh, but like a, a crisp kind of definition then I feel like it's it's really nice having this there's so much that's already gone into creating this portrait and then just being able to like accentuate a few things just by drawing on top of it is uh, something which I find challenging to do with a brush and um, like something that I've tried where I, I don't really like using super fine brushes. I know some other artists do to, to wonderful effect, but it's it's something that I don't find as satisfying as like the drawing process. So then realizing the the kind of the the look or the things that I would like to do with a really fine brush, like if I can just draw that in, then um, then that's also uh, a cool way to go about it. Yes, this is uh, dark indigo um, from Faber Castell Polychromos pencils. Um, the, um, underneath it's brown. I'll show you on on this piece of paper. It's like this. It's a bit it's a bit dark, but it's like a it's a really dark blue. Yeah, almost like neutral tip. <laughs> Exactly. So yeah, I'm like saving the indigo just for where it's like really dark and then I'll use the magenta to, to draw in some more as well. How many um, artists are contributing to your exhibition, Louis? And it's interesting drawing, drawing back into the painting when when so much has already been established and. Um, it's, it's, it's so different to drawing onto blank paper. And and even some of the, the decisions, like these little kind of a, a shape, like just drawing in some, some interesting shapes or things I'm recognizing, which perhaps have not been conveyed um, in the watercolor so much that I can just kind of accentuate things or find kind of things that have not been drawn or, or perhaps if there are, if there are little like spots in the skin or some some marks which I haven't really addressed with the paint to just be able to um, to come and draw it in. Also the hair, there's so much cool stuff going on with the hair. It'll be nice to add some more. Um, I'll call here. An exhibition to raise funds for an NGO called Children's Villages. And some boxes are used to intervene in them, creating an artistic piece for subsequent auction and thus raise money. Awesome. Is this a regular colored pencil? Uh, it's a Faber Castell Polychromos pencils, which, as far as regular colored pencils go, are pretty good. <laughs> um, they're better than the colored pencils that my kids have, <laughs> but they're not like su super fancy. I, I feel like they're kind of like the standard colored pencil in the art supply shop that I go to. There, there are so many. There's like this wall, you can get all these individual pencils. We can like get like a set of like a silly amount of colors. Um, 
silly, wonderful amount of colors. <laughs> but um, I was just talking about this on Tuesday in the Zoom session that I, the only thing I, f I felt like I was envious of as a child was my friend who had this amazing box of pencils that had like two tiers of colors. And it was just like, it was like on a shrine in their bedroom. And I was just like, look at all of those colors, all those pencils, it's amazing. And they were Derwent pencils. Um, and it really, it was like, seemed like treasure. And, and now I, I have a set of 12 pencils and I feel like there's so much you can do just with those 12 colors. <laughs> what was that? Oh no, that's okay. <laughs> no need to be sorry. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> It's um, a painting of Gretchen in your, your profile photo. Yeah, it's cool. We, um, Holly and I have a date with a dog tomorrow. <laughs> um, Kira uh, wrote into like a, a group chat of our village um, asking if anyone has a dog that they would be happy to share because <laughs> um, Holly loves dogs so much, but it's um, we're not in a situation at the moment to get our own dog. But whenever we go for a walk, she, she always wants to engage with dogs and pat them and love them. And, and so Kira had this great idea to just be like, does anyone want to share their dog? <laughs> because then if, if they potentially need someone to look after their dog that we could look after them, we could, take the dog for walks sometimes because it needs to go out a couple of times every day. So Holly and Kira went to meet the dog whose name is Polly, Polly and Holly. <laughs> Holly. Holly is my daughter and Polly is the dog. They went to meet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, they went, they went to meet Polly this morning and tomorrow morning, Holly and I are going to take Polly for a walk. So that's exciting. Yeah. And Holly, she's she's quite yeah. <laughs> True. It's great for kids and great for adults. Um Holly was actually bitten by a dog a couple of years ago. Um and she has recovered amazingly well. Like even after she was bitten and it was really like had a very bloody hand and had to go to hospital and it was it was clear like it was so visible that when she saw dogs, she still was interested in them, but was like um, really hesitant and standoffish, I guess. But um, it took a while, but she kept kind of getting closer and closer to dogs after being bitten. And now she's like, she get down to them face to face. And when if they want to, <laughs> she always asks first and um, she's, she's very well practiced in interacting with dogs. And it's just been wonderful to see how, um, yeah, how how much she loves them, <laughs> and that e even though she was um, bitten, and it was quite a quite an ordeal, that she's really kind of grown through it, and yeah, it's really cool. All right, I'm. What paper am I using today? Thank you for asking, Lewis, and anyone who maybe joined late. This is a Hanamula Burgund paper, which is 120 pound, 250 gram cold pressed mat. It says cold pressed mat. This is interesting, Barbara, because I feel like this paper is so different to the paper that I used in the class, in the course. And this is this is the first painting I've done in this block of paper. I feel like it's a different paper, even though it says the same same thing on the front. <laughs> um, like the texture of this is totally different. Yeah, yeah. Look at this. This this this, this looks like canvas, and this doesn't. <laughs> but I'm I'm pretty sure they said the same thing on the front. 
Ah, no, it didn't. Ah, here we go. It says rough. This is the one I used that said rough. Um, interesting. Now I know. Now I know. So for future reference, anyone who wants to do watercolors that look like they're on canvas, if you're able to, you can get Hanamule Bugund. Rough. Huh. Hmm. Good question. What do I like more? I I'm feeling I'm feeling about done for for today's stream. I'm going to put the reference down and look look at these. Um, so the question was, which do I like more? Um, of the papers, <clears throat> the the pro the process. Um, between these two different approaches to painting? Ah, oh, that's a good question. What do I like more? I feel I feel good about this. I felt so excited about this. Like when I did when I painted this one, I felt like, oh, oh this is oh, it's it's so it was like after feeling like kind of so controlled with the painting of Gloria, this just felt like so expressive and so free and just like not even thinking about what the actual colors are, just using color. I was very excited. Like this is a very playful process. I really like this. Um, I like both of them, but I felt like the process was felt more fun and exciting and, and new doing this. So this is lesson six um, of 15 lessons. If you're still watching and you're not in my course, it's a, a 15 lesson portrait class where we do this kind of process where we start with a drawing and then do painting. I can actually show you the other the other paintings here. I'll zoom out of it. Um, is it cotton? Wait a minute. Where did I just put that? Oh, it's still here. Um, it says it's acid-free, age-resistant, natural white, rough. It doesn't say anything about cotton. I don't know. It doesn't say it. Um, no, they're both cold press, but this this one says mat, um, cold press mat. Um, so I, I this must also be oh, um, cold press because hot pressed is like ironed and flat, um, but this just has a, a different structure to it. Yeah. Um, all right, so I'll just show you, I'll show you the paintings. So this, the, these two kind of, they belong, they're, they're a, a process. There's kind of a, like a development all the way through the lessons and I don't really have them here sequentially anymore, but I'll just show you some of them. I feel like this one I've, I've just done of Lena is um, is much more subdued than, than a lot of these. Like I was saying, I was really ex like exploring the color. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's it's great that you're taking your time. Um, yeah, it's interesting. It's it's really it's cool seeing that people are people are doing it all at at their own pace and. And I really enjoy seeing that every day someone is, has been, so far, every day has someone has been starting and sharing their first piece. Um, so that's been really cool to see as well. And Bonnie wrote today and said that she wants to do the course with her kids. So that's really cool. And this one, this was super fun. I don't, I don't know if uh, Nidima is still here, um, but just shared saw and shared your portrait. So this was the first one. This is lesson one. This is this is the one of Ignace that I see people starting with every day, and that's it's been really cool. And as I mentioned earlier in the live stream, um, these are all compiled into a PDF to print a zine at the end of the class, uh, which is which is really fun. And I, I have a whole bunch of these zines of of my work. From the class. 
And this is one which I painted like this for the sake of filming, but is actually like this, like Zan was turning Lena on the side today. So yeah, those are the paintings that I make that you can follow along with in the class. And yeah, it's interesting, like kind of consideration, like what, what process I prefer. I don't know. I like doing lots of different things. <laughs> um, I don't feel like set on a particular process. Um, so yeah, the, the one of me today was definitely like really exciting to do. It felt like oh, this is something I should do more of. Um, and and um, Mitre or Ima from Lesson 6. Um, I'll just grab something totally different. So this is, um, I was talking about using calligraphy pens, uh, a broad nib. This is also a process which I, I love very much because it's so direct. Everything is just black. Um, and this is with this 3.8 millimeter parallel pen. This is also a process which I love. Um, so yeah, I, I, I find it very, I feel like a flow within different kind of approaches to doing things and find each different approach enjoyable and satisfying. And in some way, the, the different ways of working also inform and flow into um, decisions that are made working in a totally different uh, medium. So the all of the ink work that I've done over the years, I feel like has strongly influenced the way I work with pencil, and which was like a surprise when I realized that it had made me more confident with pencil work. and. Um, and there's something in the way of the layering of watercolor, which I also take from the way that I use ink, ink wash, all of the um, pieces behind me. Oops. Uh, a lot of them are natural ink portraits and they are, um, oh, it's weird, this mirror thing. Yeah, a lot of natural ink portraits here and they're, they're all like this layered ink wash approach and I feel like that's totally informed the way I uh, work with watercolors as well. So all these different things that I, there are so many processes which I enjoy um, and they, they have a different quality to them. This felt more subdued. The other, the Mitre piece, really exciting and um, fresh. Yeah, and I, I don't know, I just will keep going and see where each one of them take me. A freer use of color. Yeah, yeah, that's really good about using black and white references that it's so, um, because I had had this piece of Lena, the, the photo, which is so nice. So I was, although it's um, lighter and not as intense in the contrast, I'm still really informed by the colors that I'm seeing in the image. Whereas working from a black and white reference can give you the freedom um, to, oh, you're still here, cool, cool. Um, yeah, can, can give you the, a black and white reference can just be like, okay, I'm just going to look at values and use whatever color I want um, and play around with these kind of water, watery marks and stuff is a really, um, something which is very fitting to the medium, like using watercolor in a very watery way. Uh, yeah, so that's in store for you in lesson six. Uh, and it's, I'm, I'm particularly, curious to hear about people's experience with the combination of uh, lesson five and lesson six, um, because that was, for me, within all of them was a very, uh, very interesting process to, to do these two very different paintings, like back to back. Um, does anyone have any more colors? Thank you to everyone who's in Zoom. Um, whether you've been chatting or quietly working along, uh, it's really wonderful having you here. And um, yeah, for, for, yeah. Send the reference. 
Yes, I, I was I can can send it to you. Are you in the Facebook group? So for everyone in the class, there is. Yeah, um, the Facebook group or the reference. I can I could I'll send you the reference. Oh, yeah, I'll put the reference in in the chat. Yeah, you're in the class because there is a Facebook group, but I know that not everyone who's in the class is in the group. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I can. I think I should be able to just drop it in uh, to to the to the chat here. It's in the chat now, so you can grab it from there. Um, there will there will be some more of these sessions as well. So I'm thinking the next one will probably be in two weeks. So for the the first couple months of the watercolor class, which is going to live on, and people can join it at any time. Maybe you're watching this video after the the live event. And everyone um, can feel free to join my observational drawing and watercolor portraiture class. Um, but yeah, in the next uh, the next couple of months, I will do some more of these sessions where we get together, and everyone who's in the class is welcome to join in Zoom. And if any questions arise throughout the um, through the lessons, and if there's something you would like me to particularly address, then I'm happy to do so. And I really appreciate having you all here. And thank you to everyone uh, watching on YouTube. If you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, then um, do that. That would be a great thing to do. You can give me a thumbs up as well. And I, I live stream quite regularly and would love to have you along whenever you have time or you can catch the replays. So um, that's right. Um, yeah, so the calligraphy, yeah, thank you. The calligraphy painting class is also on the Carabolic Art School. And Lewis, who's in the chat, is on the front cover. Um, and this is the one where we make a zine and it's all on one sheet of paper. So yeah, this class is also on the Carabolic Art School. Yeah, cool. And um, a very different approach. And I feel like a, a really wonderful way to practice working with ink and doing um, this kind of working towards doing direct ink drawings. So yeah, this is the, the zine and all of the pieces that we make in the calligraphy pen portraiture class with this big spread of Robert Waldy here. So we really play with the format of the zine in this class, more so than in the watercolor one, but I show you how to make a PDF in the watercolor portraiture class. So you can print one of these zines, which is a cool thing to do. Um, yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you, YouTube. Uh, see you again next time. And thank you everyone in Zoom and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Oh yeah, I'm gonna, in Zoom,